Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dr. Deep State. Our video today is entitled Public Opinion, Who Shapes It and to What End? So I'm going to talk about what I'm going to do on the video, I'm going to present the video, and then I'm going to hop over to Locals to do part two of the video. And because of the events going on in the world today, what I have in mind is getting back to some of the basics with this channel, some real fundamental ideas about the deep state, how it works, and to what ends. And to that end, I'm going to talk about public opinion right now. And I would like to say this, I, because of what's going on in the world, I think it's important that I rethink what I'm doing here on YouTube and over on Locals. I want to be very open to anybody looking for truth, generally speaking, over here on this channel. Over on the locals, it's more tuned into the cross-section between uh, traditional Catholic thinking and the deep state. So that's what I got on over there. However, more than ever, the censorship regime is alive and well. So I am going to put increasing amounts over there that need to be there because they simply can't be here. And given what's going on in the world, I'm going to be doing more of that kind of material. And we have a membership over there. A lot of the articles and so forth are free. Um, and occasionally I'll drop videos uh, that I can't do because of subject uh, sensitive subject matter. I'll put that over there. But generally, I'm working for my support group over there. It's $5 a month. It is very Catholic and it's very deep state, that group over there. And that's fundamentally what drives uh, a lot of the production that I'll be doing throughout the week. Um, so just letting you know, uh, that's how that's basically going to be breaking down. Now on this channel, I will, pre I will be presenting uh, Catholic saints and a lot of Catholic priests, particularly ones that have been memory hold, particularly ones that go against the mainstream narrative of their time, because that's essentially what I'm doing over here in Dr. Deep State. And more than ever right now, what we call the alternative media, generally speaking, in my opinion, there used to be sort of just the mainstream. And then there were generally what would be called truth channels over here. After the last election debate, they kind of got consolidated into something that's called alternative media, which essentially, for my money, operates essentially like the gatekeeping mechanism of the old mainstream news. So I am going to, I'm not finger pointing, but I'm going to have to suggest that a lot of that particularly in regard to that narrative, is channeling us in to a certain direction and a certain outcome. So I am going to be opposed, generally speaking, more clearly than ever, to what we nowadays call the alt media and Catholic influencers. Again, I hate to be a finger pointer, but this is what's happening. They're absorbing the alternative narrative and essentially they're bringing it into the way they inform their audience. So I will have to sort of position myself as operating different from them. I don't want to necessarily, but that's how it's going to go down. What's being shaped right now needs to be understood, I will argue, uh, in opposition to the narrative that's being spun in alternative media that includes almost all of the Catholic influencers. So on this channel, I'll be presenting fundamental deep state stuff again, kicking stuff that I can't talk about this over onto locals with a particular emphasis on uh, the, the cross streams between Catholic traditional thinking and, and um, the deep state. And, you know, again, the fundamental idea in both cases is that the war that we're appealing to right now that's going on in the world is a war against reality and the mainstream and the alternative media are bringing us into more of a copy something that's a simulation of reality more than actual events so let's just get to it what i'm going to do here is present what i would what i what i present in a college course 
And it's really one of my least favorite things to present. I'm going to talk about public opinion. And I, I'm going to use sections of what I do in my lectures that's not the stuff out of textbooks. And I'll tell you about the reaction I usually get. I've taught this at colleges and universities, north, south, east, west, and the reaction tends to be pretty much the same. People are used to getting information from that's been filtered through a test book, uh, textbook, and it's usually in the social sciences positivistic. What that means is that it doesn't question the narrative. It just, in the case of public opinion, it's just going to look at how you define it and how you measure it. So what I'm interested in reality that I have defined as being historical, hierarchical, and sacramental. So most of the modern social sciences are a historical. They come up with a foundational model about how people think and perceive the world, usually a rational actor model that's a historical. It just comes in with, with assumptions, positivistic assumptions about reality. It's not hierarchical. It's always working from an assumption that the old world was somehow faulty and that the new world of equalitarianism is moving us closer to a kind of truth where I argue it's moving us closer to a simulacrum of reality. And finally, it's not sacramental. And what I mean by that is that view of reality takes in both the transcendent and the eminent. It takes its raw cardinal uh, naturalistic view of the world. So with that in mind, uh, here is my usual response from students when I do this. Wherever the college or university, it's just blank looks. They don't have categories for this thought. They've never been presented it. It hits their system biopolitically. They've been kind of engineered to kind of resist this kind of information. In one case, I was presenting this at Mississippi, in Mississippi, big auditorium, 200 plus students. I actually had people walking out of the classroom. So I hope, I, I don't think any of you, will, maybe I'll just click your computer off. That would probably be easier. Um, thinking back, I, I was on a stage and I had a microphone and maybe I had a little too much attitude when I was doing it. I didn't let it bother me. It did hurt my feelings a little bit, but I would present the same um, type of information to higher level um, IR type of classes or political science, foreign policy classes. And when they had time to sit down and look at the scholarly literature and then discuss it, they truly embraced it in that context. So I, I realized that um, over the years, how you present it matters a lot. So with that in mind, I'll tell you what I teach. And hopefully and it's some of this to some audiences, the world has changed, and now the deep state is not something that people automatically react like that to. And I think people are right now being invited into thinking about this. I think this kind of thinking is being kayfabbed into sort of narratives right now, and that gets a little complex, I realize. But let's get to it, and I will show you my how I present this information to a real base level class. Um, dealing with the social science issue of what is public opinion. So we're, let's get to it. Um, and I hope you can see this public opinion. We're, uh, you know, this is what we're going to kind of look at how it exists in the context of modern democracy, how it's measured and how it influences people. And the basic definition of public opinion, get myself off of here.
what I'm arguing here and why I'm making a big pay- case of this, this is very crucial, what's going on in the world. There being There is quite the agenda at play and it's important to get my narrative out. I'm never usually too pushy about that, um, but this kind of information that I am presenting, this point of view of what's gone on in the last week is something that you can't say it's literally censored out of the alternative media. So I'm going to be very touchy about when and how I project my interpretation of the events. I've seen more empirical evidence. I'm more sure than ever about what went down, but I'm kind of thinking like, what happens to the brain? What happens to our, like, how do we shape ideas and information and reality itself? How do we put it in a frame to apprehend the events going on in our world? What's going on up there? And I guess it's its mass would be about a pound. Its consistency would be that of custard going on there in our cranium. And can it be manipulated? I think you know the answer <laughs> and from my perspective, but can it be manipulated? Or is it just raw information? And here's the bigger question they're asking. Are our thoughts our own? How we view reality, um, are we able to, and if so, are we able to freely think and speak about events in the world or is somebody restricting it? What we see right now happening is there's this continue, there's this two-step, the Kabbalistic two-step that always takes place. First, this, you know, the blue team, the purple team, the yellow team, the left, they have their censorship of issues they're comfortable censoring and then the regime lets up and then the other side does it and the effect of if we're just comfortable censoring or allowing ourselves to be censored for information that fits our comfort level then there's a scheme at place that both sides the dialectic is being channeled into a a speech code or a speech regime, which is adds up to be a thought regime. So our thoughts are being channeled and we're seeing more than ever that what essentially ideas or ideologies are, it's a lot of political identification. They're a product of socialization and just a psychological comfort level with one side or the other that really is as crude as sport, and the arbitrary uh, cheering for one sports team over another and I'm going to like them no matter what compare I'm going to hate you no matter what and we're getting channeled into that it's it, it ends up being I will argue a lot of times not about ideas so my answer to that what I'm going to present as a point of view is that oftentimes uh no our view our our minds are being manipulated and a lot of times it's being manipulated through what we see and how we can express our thoughts about what we see Now, the textbook rationalistic explanation of the reality that we're under will tell
us this clip right here, but I will show different clips that under scientific um, conditions, when you look at people, just so we know this in the background, that people are, are not at all rational. Uh, it's a good heuristic operative model to use that we basically work uh, rationally. If you're going to try a court case, it's a good assumption that people have goals and it's a good way to look at empirical evidence on the table as we said it. However, um, this particular clip, I'm not going to play it. It's an experiment where people are in a waiting room, a bell goes off and one woman stands up and it shows that like a Pavlovian dog, people will just follow the information, even if it makes no rational sense. And next thing you know, a whole room of people are standing and sitting at the bell. Um, even people that think that they're going to fight the power, if, you know, they're not going to go with the flow. We find out that there's sort of these, you know, we want to be in sapatico as sort of creatures of the earth, like, you know, fish go in formation and birds go in formation. We have humans do tend to go with the herd. And even though, because it, it's just uncomfortable, presenting this to students is uncomfortable. I don't like the vibe in the room when I'm doing this. Um, but I do show this video sometimes to kind of warm them up, to let them know, scientifically speaking, we truly are huge herd animals. And there really is a cost, a biological cost to our systems and our psyches when we go against the curb, uh, go against the herd. So, um,
America. And boy, students just, you know, especially if you go in like gung-ho gun country, real red meat eating country, um, you have to be careful about how you say this. So I kind of con I, I contextualize it now. I say, now what Texville saying about America? He's saying this form of mind control of shaping public opinion is going to come to the whole world. That's why he's considered sort of a prophet of the modern age. But he's speaking about America. And, uh, you know, so I know my audience is from all over. So I know a lot of you won't take offense. But and again, it's different when if I would have presented this information 10 years ago from today, because I think a lot of things we've seen a lot of crazy things happen in the last five and even 10 years. I know of no other country where there is, because he's saying this, bear in mind, in the United States Constitution, first and foremost, it's founded on this idea that we have a right to free speech. It's the beginning of our Bill of Rights. And that is, that is a completely novel device. So he was really interested in what's going to happen when legally, this is the first time a country legally can say any damn thing they want. And he's saying, there is a bizarre, ironic twist that takes place. He says, I know of no other country where there is so little independence of thought and freedom of discussion. In any constitutional state of Europe, every sort of political theory may be freely discussed and preached. Um, in a, so he's saying at some point, if you're going to present it at least as a political theory, there's kind of a hands-off point. However, in America, the majority holds barriers around freedom of speech and few cross that barriers. They're invisible. They're not legal barriers. He said, in Europe, even if there are legal barriers, you still find more freedom of speech there. And he's getting his finger right on the control mechanism of modern man. First of all, modern man's pride that he thinks he's progressed from an age that was historical, hier hierarchical, and sacramental. That pride is what keeps him in Plato's cave, looking at the images on the wall. Finally, Tuckville says here, the control of the majority is more powerful than any king of Europe. And for some of you that maybe can imagine being an undergrad in college, you can imagine why I just see blank faces. People just don't get that. And that's what I'm doing if I link my book in pursuit of the metaverse. That's the foundational. We're so far into the simulacrum. We're kind of almost from, from Christendom. We're three stages. I go through the three stages removed that when we hear information like this, that what Christendom was more tuned into reality, it can't be the case. That just can't be the case. We have the internet. This is exactly what Tuckville fe feels your pride. So in fact, what we have, according to Tuckville with the internet, if I was going to project the internet on Tuckville or Tuckville on the internet, he'd say we have an insane quantity of information, but the quality it, it conversely is densed down so that we're prisoners in a very new and very um, advanced form of what we now call 6G uh, warfare over the mind. Tuckville would continue. It covers, th this is how this manipulation system works. You can't even put a finger on it. It's like who controls the deep state kind of thing. It, you know, who is the cabal? It covers the surface of society with a network of small, complicated rules, minute and uniform, through which the most original minds and the most energetic characters cannot penetrate to rise above the crowd. Look at what happened five years ago. How many of your fancy doctors and lawyers and preachers and teachers and musicians could call out such an obvious charade? You know, and that's what he's saying. That's the force that we're under. Your IQ will not necessarily protect you. Um, because it penetrates every aspect of society. The will of man is not shattered, but softened, bent, and guided. Men are seldom forced by it to act. But just like you don't have to follow the mandate, but they are constantly restrained from acting. Such a power does not destroy, but it prevents 
existence. It does not tyrannize, but it compresses, enervates, extinguishes, and stupefies a people till each nation is reduced to nothing better than a flock of timid and industrious animals of which the government is the shepherd. And can you imagine if you're a student and you've been told your whole life you're smarter than anybody, you got the internet, everybody's a winner, you all, you all get sent home with a juice pack and a blue ribbon, you're just so flippin' special. And kids just, that just goes against psychically, mimetically, and um biopolitically, everything that they know. So they just shut down. They know it sounds smart. And the beautiful part about that paragraph, that was translated into French. And it just it just renders into English absolutely beautifully. Okay, so what Tuckville is saying here is modernity itself, at its base, this system of control, and what I add on to this, it's the perfect system from which oligarch follow the money the people who have historically always been the true power centers, the best, in fact, the best restraint against oligarchy ever is a king. However, nobody wants to think that. That's why they had to destroy that. It's a soft tyranny. It pervades society. It's not forced per se, but it's a constraint. It does not destroy. It prevents from having the ideas exist in the first place. Society is reduced to the flock and government is its shepherd. And from this, this is confirmed. Um, and by the way, uh, 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 Tuckville read Madison and was actually impressed by Madison very much. And the idea that public opinion, again, sets the boundaries to every government. It's the real power. And that's why they have to um, maybe they can manipulate the vote, but they do want you psychically on board with the program. Okay, and the assumption there is that you get to freely choose this channel or that channel. Hey, you got the internet. You're able to, you know, you're able to click away and find whatever you want and weigh what you want. And the lie there is that uh, you you might have complete information. There are people that called out the event from 22 years ago, 24 years ago, who called out the event from five years ago, who are calling out the event, but they're few and far between because they are sometimes soft censorship on some of these platforms. And if you're going to kind of discuss, uh, discuss what's going to happen and say, you know, the whole enchilada, um, you're going to be out of syncopatico and that's the control mechanism right there. And so you're making a decision, but um, even if you can present to people, well, here empirically, this makes more sense. Look at the buildings. Look at, let's, let's analyze aluminum versus steel. Let's look at the temperature of heat. And we can do this with the event that happened. How does blood come out? What, what would a, a wound like that disappear? Can we compare that to another kind of wound? Empirically, would it work that way? And so forth. But you don't have to. Once people have made up their mind and they're in sync with a majority opinion, it is in, it's extremely, only a certain type of individual will walk away from that, that, that opinion once formed. And that's why I feel I need to come in forcefully right now when there's still a little bit. Because momentically, when people have attached themselves to an opinion of what happened uh, there, uh, 23 years ago in New York, even later when they kind of find themselves able to empirically examine the evidence, momentically that narrative is still set in their minds. Walter Lippmann. Now he's going to talk about just, he's taking those Tuckvillian ideas and he's kind of going with them. And he is again going to problematize um, he's going to problematize this rational actor, um, positivistic, natural uh, paradigm that we receive through the textbooks in social science, high school, college, university, grad school. It's the paradigm, and that's the power of it. Because the higher you go, the more you, the more pride you get. And as long as you're unfamiliar with this paradigm, you don't go there because you're out of sync. 
and that's biopolitical. So that's the operative control mechanism of the oligarchs in the modern world is biopolitics, finding out how to get you synced into the majority. So if you can own the newspapers, the television, and fund the major alternative platforms, you're going to build that syncopatico in the narrative and woe to those people. Either you're going to literally censor them out of the major, the X's, the YouTube's, you're going to major them, and then you're going to have free speech, but you're going to be out of reach. And so you're going to be there, you're not going to be in syncopation with others. And it's a hard slog doing this kind of work like this and having the minor opinion. You're not pop. You're just not popular, you know, but fortunately, and you would think you would think from what happened just five years ago that people would go, aha, I see this happening. But if you can rush your key people in in the alternative view and then all the other people who are just motivated by having a big platform and calling, you know, being popular, that's the front and center, not truth, because a truth seeker will say, I'm willing to endure pain to have it. And that's not most people. OK, so. Um, what does Walter Lippmann do now? What he is doing subtly um, at this time, the Tavistock Institute had been over there, funded by the City of London, located in the in London, and it was there to shape the opinions for people to enter World War II and to really look at how to shape people that have been traumatized, whether physically or psychologically, as a result, and seeing how you could control individuals and people on mass. And he doesn't cite that material, but he was involved in it. So it's an important caveat to play out here. So public opinion in 1922. Now, bear in mind, um, we didn't yet have talkies in the movie. The movie houses were still moving, but he's really interested in that. He's really analyzing movie um, motion pictures. And already motion pictures had been around probably really in any meaningful way less than 10 years. But he already radically noticed the difference when people receive information through reading it and how they absorb it and can truly kind of weigh it out and critically examine it, how compared to how what happens when they receive it through visuals and you know parlor music playing as you're getting it and the manipulation of the violins and the tones. And it's, he says massively manipulative. So and also radio had been out, of course. Um, so public opinion, and this sets the tone really up until the internet age, public opinion is volatile, unlike public opinion from the past that tended to be shaped within the constraints of history, hierarchy, and a notion of the sacrament or the sacred. Um, it's volatile compared to just, you know, a decade earlier, it radically shifts according to whatever recent developments are going on. And at this time, radio would have this new innovation called um, up-to-date reports. And it was very novel to the mind. It got you hooked on what is new. Um, before that, you know, sometimes way back before that, you only maybe got a newspaper once a month. Increasingly, people had them in the day. Maybe occasionally in the major cities at this point, you might have a mid-afternoon newspaper. But the radio was a game changer. Often you got hooked on this idea of what is new, even in the course of a single day, even out, even from people outside of your, your influence. So public opinion is volatile. It's incoherent. It lacks any organized or consistent basis. That is why you can look at an event, if they've been shaped mimetically, you can show the empirical evidence. And it won't because it's modern public opinion is based on being in sync with the majority and largely it's incoherent. And that's why people mostly are slaves to fashion. What's in what's in fashion, what's out of fashion, what meme is popular, what meme is old fashioned. Over here, he said, essentially he's saying over here, it's, it's a non-attitude. It's almost meaningless in saying anything about how real public opinion says almost nothing. There's no direct correlation between reality and public opinion. He's saying that 
a hundred years ago. Public opinion is irrelevant. Political leaders, here's what he's saying. This is hard. Whoever's going to make our fundamental decisions about what war we're going to go to, who's going to profit from that war, what our currency of exchange is going to be, who's going to be involved in international trade negotiations, etc. The things that really shape and build or destroy a society or even a civilization, those opinions are not set. And that's the magic of uh, of this whole thing. People think that they put, pick a leader and that they're in, somehow involved in these fundamental decisions. But people aren't even informed about, you know, back then it would have been the gold standard that today, really, if we're going to war or what, what organizations are going to profit from that war. So he said it's irrelevant to any fundamental issue, understanding uh, the influence of every event uh, within the lives of evidence who depend. So um, he's saying, in a sense, it, this is what's going on in modernity. So how do people get you glued in? Like if you, even if you kind of know somehow you maybe heard it uh, on your own, you probably didn't learn this in school, unless maybe it was a media class or something like that, they might graze on some of these ideas. Um, and by the way, uh, when I, people found out I was teaching these, I was viewed very unfavorably, usually as a visiting professor, and they let me do it because I'm only there for three years. And so because I chose that path early on, because I wanted to do this kind of material, you are absolutely set at odds if this is what you're presenting, you know, with, with other faculty. I, you know, I don't want to presume that I know what they're thinking, but uh, they, they can't go head on and say I disagree and stuff like that. They just let you know you're out of sync with your colleagues. Um, and yeah, so essentially, what are what 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 decisions are we left with in society? It's always the little cultural stuff. People might be fooled into thinking you can vote over uh, right to life policies. In my opinion, those are very controlled who gets to decide and who gets to profit from those, but they hook you in on that. And one of the biggest corral mechanisms is to get some voting blocks into just obsessing that like in a single issue and completely ignoring the lives of people on the other side of the world that are, that are uh, the wars that are being executed for very dubious reasons and look the other way, who's profiting from this? Is this fundamentally corrupt or moral? We don't want to deal with those moral. When that becomes uncomfortable, we decide to ignore those issues and just focus here in our little wheelhouse. But then when we want to build something or we want to accept something, because we're really more about being in sync with what's popular than truth, we'll then you know, selectively look at foreign issues if it's comfortable for us and if not. And that's exactly the biopolitical control that keeps the modern man in the cave with the pride that Plato described. They're in the cave, the marinettes are dancing as shadows on the wall, and people are nudging each other, taking such pride as, I think he's going to do that next, and I think he's going to do that next. And woe to me, the person that looks down on Shackles the train, moves toward the true light, dares to see the true light comes back and tells the people in front of the cave, the puppets in the cave, and they, they're they on a sink to the degree that they just might kill you. And uh, that is really the magic of manipulating the modern mind. It works through pride. Um, so Tuckville, uh, sorry, Walter Lippmann would say, and again, he's the most influential journalist slash really took the media component to its fullest and he's saying, so how does modern man fundamentally, fundamentally shape his or her opinion? And Walter Lippmann would say, it is not from books. It's not from ideas. The cleverness of blue people, or the Tories versus the labor, you're thinking you're looking at all these issues. And when I vote for this person, that's the outcome of the policies. Empirically, it's not. It's just simply not. When you look empirically, do you get those policies from that politician? That's why I've had videos on what's called the Washington Consensus. I could do the corollary over there in the UK. They do not match up. Occasionally they do, and those are highlighted, but overall, statistically, they do not match up. They do what's going on right now, the trick. It's the two-step. 
We're going to have the censorship from the right for issues you're comfortable with. Then we'll have the censorship from the left. They do that with all kinds of policy choices. So that's the magic of this. So how do they get people to glue back into the system, to the dialectic and get engaged with the simulacrum? Because that's what I'm trying to tell you. You can't apprehend anything until you apprehend reality and you have to unglue this from this deliberately pernicious system. Dialectics is a common word. East, you know, east, west, north, south, blue, red, Democrat, Republican, get you back into the narrative. Now, over the last several years, people are starting to get wise to, wait, everybody's kind of, the media's kind of funded. And over the summer, aha, wait, we see who we can't criticize. Maybe they control everything. Well, wait, once we actually look, in fact, they kind of are there controlling our politics, our culture, and our um, systems of information, whether they be um, media or universities and uh, primary education. They're there, the same actors, and they're operating as if they have an agenda. So when people start to kind of wait, wait a minute, maybe I might in dis disengage a little bit, then they get the trauma event, the killing of the king, so to speak, the user, they get you back involved. So you don't dare being the person out of sync, uh, out of fashion. It's like coming in, you know, when people don't wear the bib overalls anymore and you still want to wear the bib overalls and people are looking at you like you're a rube that belongs out there. That should be hanging from a scarecrow, not on you. So they, the, 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 they've changed the script and memetically you have to get on board. Okay. So he said, what do they do? Simply this way. They put the picture in your head. And that's how the blue people put the pictures in their head. The red people put the pictures in their head. And, and people are a slave to those images. And it's that simple. Now, if I were going to elaborate on this, the second layering of this to the picture or what's probably intertwined with this is they put the myth. Not that it's true or not, but it's kind of the narrative about what's being um, prescribed and or proscribed at the same time. And so with that convergence, you get the picture and it tells you biopolitically in your gut, in your mind, how to act and how to think about that issue. And so it's the picture and the, and the attaching narrative or myth that creates the mythos or the ethos from which you are going to operate. Um, and that's what we saw over the last week. That's why conveniently um, the images were there and they will loom larger in some's minds than any empirical evidence. And once they ground that image, Maybe a few will kind of be open-minded. And you know what? At the end of the day, I truly do value truth more than just being in sync. And um, But that's not most people. That is not most people. So that's Walter Lippmann for you. And finally, and this is where, boy, you really can get people shutting down because young people, old people, most people, and I'm realizing... Uh, a lot of people are new to this site and they want to be opened up to truth, want to be opened up to this information. And maybe nobody's ever told them that it, sometimes it's good just to pull out that idea that being a good person means getting sucked. They control the narrative about just vote, 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 vote. You know, and nobody's stopping you from going and voting for a non Zio or your own independent or just writing in. Christ is king of my heart. I'm going to show up. I'm going to be a good citizen, but I'm going to tell you who wrote, who rules my world. So Bernays, of course, he's got the family connections with Sigmund Freud, and um, they're really working the science of science and induced psychosis, i.e. mass formation psychology, psychosis. And so he's laying it out there in the good Kabbalistic uh, way that they need to. Um, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in a democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism society constitute an, in, constitute an invisible government, which is the rule, true ruling power of our country. And, um, 
which country is he talking about? Well, really any country that's modern and democratic, that's the true ruling power, period. And again, if you've never heard that before, um, now, once you start seeing, if you're in a place in life where you're just kind of starting to go, most people are going, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. Or why are the blue people only pissed off when this happens, but when the same thing happens, then they're okay with the censorship. Um, why are they okay with you don't get a quiet space or a quiet time or your special things until it's their special people? And then you're kind of going, wait a minute, something's not adding up. And you're going to kind of think there's an agenda. So number one, something ain't adding up. Number two, someone's got an agenda. Number three, what is the mechanism? You know, some people just say that old saw, follow the money. Wait a minute. Why are the same donors funding both sides? I mean, what are they, which side are they committed to? And you start asking questions like that. Well, like why? Why do what what are they doing? I don't get it. I've never I don't have categories in my mind yet for this. So you're trying to figure your way through it. And at that point, then you kind of go to doing a couple clicks from the mainstream, and then you get to the next corral zone, which is the alternative media, especially this current one. You are a lot better off if you went from the mainstream 10 years ago or even five years ago. But today it is an entirely system of corralling. If you're a religious influencer, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Catholic, um, for the most part, they're going to have you and they're going to tell you, ah, yeah, there is, there is something that adds up. Um, it's a type of JFK thing and they're doing it against us. So now they can take, and that's part of what I call the egregore, the mind demon. One of the ingredients is conspiracy. So once you know something's not adding up, you're pliable. You want to figure things out and they get you. So they like a little conspiracy in the air so they can fold it back into their narrative and their agenda, sandwich it back in. And that's what we call K-fabbing. And K-fabbing involves ingredients of chaos magic, which is absurdity, something that just doesn't make up. That's why some of these stories have to have a the, the keystone cops and the fumbling detectives and, and the crazy cops and the woman that can't put the pull her hole. That's part of getting you into the magical, uh, magic with a K thinking. And so if you're not certain that you've I've been to this rodeo before kind of thing, and you see how it rolls. You can see that they're willing to do the big lie, the whole enchilada. Once you start seeing that, you can start before you get um, invested in the mimetic um, syncopatico of the newly forming, you know, that week's newly forming majority opinion, the new meme, and, you know, and committed yourself to laughing at the other side. Because once you laugh, they got gotcha. you. You've picked a team. It's not the team of truth necessarily, but I want to be comfortable. I want to be popular because that's how modern world works through the, your desire to be comfortable and to be popular. And they tap into that. And finally, I got here to go back in time a little bit. The crowd um, from Gustave uh, Le Bon. And I think I have him for the quote here in my chapter 10. I go deep into this whole concept of the creation of an egregore in the modern um, post-Protestant um, Reformation period and uh, key in on these techniques. And um, social science as a discipline was still kind of new at this time. He, again, is a French thinker. And the book is from 1895. And he said, the trick to modern opinion is to understand how to manipulate the crowd. And uh, characteristics of a crowd psychology. And again, even if you're just viewing it in the comfort of your own home, when you watch the crowd, and even on like TikTok, and, and I'll say the word X, even though I hate to, <laughs> X, they even get you, they get this crowd mentality, you to view it. That's why I think it's kind of toxic a lot of time, these platforms. But Or you're in the actual crowd, but even just viewing the crowd. Quote, impulsive, um, irritable incapacity to reason, 
And again, they don't want that right reason, the deliberating, the standing back, the looking at the evidence. Um, when, you're being, when, you're, when your mind's being shaped, they want you into that impulsive, irritable, think of what X is really about, pushing your damn buttons, right? Incapacity to reason, the absence of judgment of the critical spirit, the exaggeration of sentiments and others. Laban claimed that, quote, an individual immersed for some length of time in a crowd soon finds himself, or today we'd say him or herself, either in consequence of a magnetic, and now we can kind of say, um, we'll, we'll just say magnetic or mimetic influence. Um, very deep, very mysterious, given out by the crowd or from some other cause of which we are ignorant in a special state which much resembles the state of fascination in which the hypothesized individual finds himself in the hands of the hypnotizer. So he understands here. He is not working from this positivistic, they, back then, the early social science, and even in America in the first half of the century, they didn't use just this hard, cold positivism. They were historical, and they used, even in economics, they used a historical analysis, and they realized through history that there's never just this one damn thing after another narrative that we've been given of accidental history. There's always a controlling hand with an agenda. The, he says, hypnotizer. And we know now from Bernays and from Lippmann and things that have happened dramatically, whether it was back in Germany a long time ago or more recently, there's always something at play. And I hate to say it this way, the whole enchilada concept, but you have to have that frame of mind. Um, there are people in this world um, that have pretty much, we call them a cabal, that have always been around and they're always trying to manipulate, manipulate the hearts, minds, souls, and perception of humans. And usually they do it in a disdaining way, thinking of them as the herd or even sometimes calling them the herd or animals. And they reckon or fancy themselves as uh, sort of the herdsmen. And so it's almost like this job, the eugenics movement very much took on this mentality that uh, we're, our job is to, to kind of think of them in positivistic uh, things. How do they think? How do we measure it? Um, how can we apply what we've experimented with Pavlo and his dog? How can we now that put that into a social science, control what they learn and make any knowledge or any thought about this historical understanding of an unseen hand Make that taboo. Those are the weirdos. And uh, anything related to how people apprehended reality in a foregone age, that was old. That was from the age of backwards people. We're sophisticated. They tickle your pride that your vote matters. And they especially and have always been the masters of controlling the information in the cave in the modern world. Um, it's either the TV or the magazines, and you can see how the cabal, like literally you can go in, who are, who, who are the key people in, uh, in terms of the shareholders, and more subtly on the internet. And so in the modern world, and as ultimately one of the directions they're going through is bio-digital convergence from the left and the right. That's what we're not looking because we're so trapped in our culture wars with our little panic buttons being hit, that we're not seeing that both sides are moving us into biopolitical convergence. And they do that by tracking what we watch, what we like and don't like. So we're being algorithmically nudged into a new type of alternative reality. And how do they control that? They control the pattern, patterns of, first of all, what you can speak. And that there is this illusion that you can, if you want to go out and look at anything, and communicate with people online from smaller platforms. Go ahead and do it, but you're going to be at a cocktail party. You're going to want to be that person. Did you see this TikTok? Did you see that show? Did you watch Netflix? And the guy that just said, no, I don't really watch TV. And I've done this now, I think it's 13 years. And I, I'm looked at like I am, I must be stupid. I must have missed all this. 
And I don't feel like I've missed anything in life. I think maybe someday I'll start watching movies again. I just don't feel like I've missed anything. I'd still watch things that are entertaining in certain ways from around the world, but I'm open up to exploring things that just, uh, never mind. that's a side topic. But a lot of people that want to get out of the simulacrum, that's the question, what do you want me to do? And I think when people ask that, that what they're saying is, I don't like the lack of comfort. I like being, I like being in syncopatico with the majority. So what am I supposed to do? In part, they mean, who do you want me to vote for? Um, but also, like, how am I supposed to fill up my time? If that's a challenge for you, maybe it's not for you. Maybe you belong in the simulacrum. Um, and nowadays, you, you get a choice. You want to do the mainstream one or the alternative mainstream one. But right now, the kind of information I'm going to be presented, I have to jump over to locals because I know that they will not allow it. That's how they're corralling you and keeping you in the cave. So this has been Dr. Deep State for today. If you want to go over and become a member of locals, I may or may not include this because I'm going to put some hot stuff, my next take over what's going on. I got a couple of things that are hot, 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 and I'm going to put it over there. I may do it every now and then. I want to make some available for members. You do have to sign up. But the, my, 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 the people I love over there are my supporters. It's $5 a month. I'm going to put another mechanism over there so we can have our own little group of talking where I'm going to even more directly engage in people with my people over there about what's going on in the week and share thoughts um, because the telegram is getting pretty big over there. But at any rate, um, thank you so much. I'm going to be back with you again very soon. I hope everybody's doing great. This has been Dr. Deep State. Bye.